I want to share a couple things with you tonight and uh, be a quick, simple teaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it, it's called the key to the house. The key to the house. You know how many times you lose the key and you can't get in the house? Uh, Hello. Sometimes you got to go through the back door. <laughs> you got to bust the window. Oh, man, what did I do with that key? Sometimes you left the door open. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go to Genesis 2. There are certain keys that God has given us. In fact, there are many keys that God has given us. And what, there are symbols of keys. There are keys of knowledge and keys of wisdom and so forth. There are certain keys that God has given us. And a key is a representation that something that locks or unlocks. It can uh, lock or, or unlock knowledge. It, it could be something in your life that you need to be released. From. It could bind you or loose you. But a key to a house is very important because the only way you can get into this house is by having the right keys. And the only way to get into the house and maintain the house is by having the right keys. Amen? Amen. Okay. One of the keys of symbolic is the number seven in the Bible is a representation of a key. Because if you don't know a combination which is also a representation of a key. You don't know how to open something or lock something. And there are certain keys, like I said, that opens mysteries of God in His Word. And one of the keys is the number seven. Number seven is a very important key to me and you. Uh, the number seven is a representation of the meaning of complete or perfect. And if you'll turn to Genesis 2 <clears throat> and verses 1 through 3, and we'll read this together. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were, finished. underline the word finished. Finished. Finished is a representation of something complete, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. In verse 2, And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day, from all of his work which he had done. So we can see that in verse 1 it says finished, doesn't it? So we see that this number 7 is a representation of finished or what he means by complete or made perfect. Because God rested. Listen, you don't go rest unless you've completed something. Okay? And number 3. And verse 3, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. So we see that this number seven this is a representation of a blessed number, isn't it? Number seven. Why? God blessed the seventh day. Well, every day for me and you is blessed. Hallelujah. In fact, in the Old Testament, it was a representation of the Sabbath day. So he blessed that day because he knew everybody was going to be working in all busy body in the world. And he wanted that one specific day for him. So he blessed that seventh day. And they acknowledged it as the Sabbath so they could acknowledge him. Hello? Does everybody understand that? So they didn't work. They didn't do anything on the seventh day or the Sabbath day. They acknowledged God and they spent time with their family because God is a family God. Hello? And now we know that, and that was all through the Old Testament, wasn't it? But when the New Testament came, when Jesus came into the world, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He said, anyone who comes on to me, anyone, I will give them what? Rest. Rest. So we see that every day for me and you should be the Sabbath day. Because we have fellowship with the Lord of the Sabbath. So every day, because if we have our trust in him and fellowship with him, Every day should be the Sabbath day for me and you. Now, of course, there is a specific day that we gather together to worship, isn't there? But that's not acknowledged as the Sabbath day because the Sabbath is the representation of a day of rest. But every day should be a Sabbath for me and you. Every day should be holy and sanctified to the Lord every single day. Amen? Amen. Praise. Hallelujah. Let's turn to John 19. <laughs> and to God be the glory. John 19 and verse 28. And it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, accomplished meaning finished, complete, 
that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. In other words, he said it was finished, but something happened before this. Seven things happened to Jesus for him to say it was finished. The first thing that happened to Jesus was he was whipped. His back was whipped. The second thing that happened was the thorns were put on his head. The third thing that was happened was his hands, two hands were nailed to the cross. And the other thing that happened was his feet were nailed to the cross. So we see two hands, two feet, his back, his head, and there was one other thing. His side was pierced. Seven places that blood ran from Jesus allowed him to say it is finished, completed, perfect. Hallelujah. Seven places. His head, his back, his two hands, his two feet, and his side. When Jesus was on the cross, the seven places on his body, the blood ran. And he was able to say, it is finished, it is complete, and it's perfect. And to God be the glory. In Isaiah 11, I'm just giving you some understanding of seven. In Isaiah chapter 11, to God be the glory. Isaiah chapter 11, and verse 1 and 2. Glory to God. The number seven representing complete, perfect, finished. In verse 1 it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's one. The Spirit of wisdom is two. Understanding is three. Counsel is four. Might is five. Knowledge is six. And reverence or fear is seven. So we see that he was going to come in the complete fullness of the Spirit of God. One was going to come from the stem of Jesse. Complete and perfect. Hallelujah. Now God also tells us how we can be complete and perfect. Now we know we're walking on, we're working for, toward perfection, aren't we? We know we still have flaws. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we are working towards perfection, aren't we? Everything we're going through. The Lord says, count it all joy as you go through trials and tribulations. Right. Why? Because God is bringing us into more and more perfection. And his perfection of towards his image and his likeness. Because Jesus was the image and likeness of the invisible God, wasn't he? Because he was God. So he was perfect, wasn't he? Hallelujah. Turn to Revelation 1. Revelation chapter 1. And to God be the glory. It is good to hear pages turning on a Sunday night. Holy Ghost Bible study. Glory to God. In Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 18. Verse 18. And Jesus is speaking and he says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So we know Jesus holds the keys of hell and death. He says, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So we see these angels were representation of messengers. Okay? Messengers of God. You can acknowledge them as pastors, leaders, or angels themselves that brought the message to the church. Okay? Jesus speaks there are seven letters in this church. In other words, there are seven messages in this church to work me and you to perfection. He gives us warnings in these seven letters. 
He gives us encouragement in these seven letters and He gives us correction and direction in these seven letters. In fact, one of them, he's the, the first church he talks about is the loveless church. In other words, they lost their first love. So he brought correction to it. What it's doing is he's telling us, because we're the church, aren't we? Amen. So these letters were to bring completion and perfection in your life and in my life. That's why we can read all the letters. I'm not going to go into that teaching tonight. I'm just giving you symbolic understanding of seven. So we see he talks about the first church of the loveless church because they lost their first love to the Lord. When you lose your first love to the Lord, you're stumbling. When he's not first in your life, something else is between you and God. There's no way you're going to walk in perfection, are you? Or that you're going to walk in the fullness of God. The next church is the persecuted church. And we will be persecuted, won't we? So he's telling us it's all right to be persecuted. The next church is the compromising church. And there's a warning for compromising, isn't there? Because compromising means that you're not willing to be persecuted. Okay? Then there's the corrupt church. And those were those who were dealing and dabbling into the things and the affairs of the world. There was the corrupt church. So he warns us, doesn't he? Don't touch anything unclean, right? And then there's the dead church. And he meant spiritually dead. We must be on fire for God. Alive in the Spirit. Worshippers. That's what brings life. The Spirit brings life, right? I mean, you can have the Word. I mean, we've been to many churches that it, the Bible says the letter killeth and the Spirit brings life. Come on, man. I've been in churches long enough in my life where they were deader than a doornail. You know? In fact, Jesus was outside of the church, I think, in some of them. <laughs> Did you ever hear that testimony? I heard this one guy of a testimony that he said that there was um, this dude was sitting on the front of the sidewalk or curb of a church, and he was bummed out. And uh, some man came up to him and said, uh, what's the matter? And he says, you know, I've got long hair, and the church just won't receive me. He says, you know, I, I, they're preaching the word and whatever, but they just won't receive me. And, uh, and the person said to him, that's okay, they won't receive me either. And come to find out that person was Jesus. Hello? Amen. Dead church. And the next church is a faithful church. A faithful church. And we need to be faithful, right? Yeah. No matter what. The only way, in fact, we need to learn, we need to earn God's trust in our life. Does everybody understand that? In other words, we earn God's trust. If we're faithful with the things He's given us, the Bible says if you're faithful a little, you get more. So these are all things that are bringing us into walking in more and more in God's perfection and His image and likeness. And the last one, He warns of the church, He says, lukewarm. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth, right? So He's saying, you must be on fire for God. Your first desire must be to please Him in all things. Okay? No matter what. So we see that He gives us seven things or seven letters to churches which if you and I were to go over and search our own heart, we would find where we're at just by those seven letters. All right? Praise God. So we need to build ourselves not only in the Word of God, but a relationship with the Spirit of God so that we can get counsel, correction, and direction from the Spirit of God because He's our comforter and He's our teacher, isn't He? Amen. And He'll bring all things to pass in our life and He'll reveal all things in our life, whether good or evil. So he's always trying to perfect me and you. We are on a constant walk of working towards perfection. And he gives us guidelines to walk in. Amen? Amen. Now would you turn to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. In verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Let's read this together. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house. Now this is Jesus speaking, isn't he? He's speaking to me and you, isn't he? Those who hear his words. Now, what does a house represent? Us. Amen. The temple. He's not talking about a physical structure of building. He's talking about a spiritual structure, and that's your house and my house. And verse 25. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on it. 
and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, this house was beat. It was beat by what? Wind, rain. Now, wait a minute. He's talking in the parallel of spirit and natural. So he's talking about attacks from the powers of darkness. The word flood means an attack from the power of darkness. Okay? And that person stood. That's why many times we've been pushed off that rock because we weren't strong in the Lord. Amen. Hello? So we need to build our house according to the ways of God, not according to the ways of man or doctrines of men. In verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So we see that you can build your house on the rock or on the sand. In verse 27, And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And let me tell you something. Many of us who have backslidden, great was the fall. You know, great was that fall. Because we began to build on the rock and we got pushed off and put on the sand. Then we started building it instead of allowing the Lord to build it. Amen. Amen. So we see that there are wise and foolish. And you and I can be wise and foolish. Well, we have that choice, don't we? We have a choice. We have a choice of what we want to build. We have a choice whether we're willing to build with the tools and equipment and blueprints and knowledge and understanding of God or on our own. And we know that we've always tried our own and we know that we fall. Because every time you go on quicksand, you fall. Hallelujah. <laughs> in Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 3 and 4. Praise be to God. Let's read this together. Proverbs 24 chapter I mean, verse 3 and 4. Through wisdom, a house is built. Everybody hear that? Through wisdom, a house is built. Through and by understanding, it is established. Now, we see that through wisdom, a house is built. Let me share with you. Wisdom is what to know what to do with the knowledge. Okay? Wisdom is to know what to do with the knowledge. Many people have knowledge, but they don't know what to do with it. Wisdom is a relationship of fellowship, fellowshipping with wisdom. In fact, the Bible tells us to cry out for wisdom, doesn't it? In verse 4, by knowledge the rooms are filled. So we see in this house there are rooms. Hallelujah. It says, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Let me share something with you. There's only one pleasant Hello? There's only one pleasant and precious rich. Jesus. His presence in those rooms. Does everybody get that? Amen. So we see that wisdom builds the house and precious riches fills the rooms. Glory to God. So we know that in this house there are rooms. Amen? In fact, go to John 14. Glory to God. Oh, we want precious, precious jewels and riches in our rooms. <laughs> in John 14, glory to God. In verse 1 through 3, and Jesus is speaking. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. The word mansions means dwellings. Hello? Dwellings. Or we could say rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus wants to be united with me and you in oneness. Amen? In oneness. So we see that even Jesus said, My Father has a house, and in this house are many dwellings or many rooms. Okay, now didn't doesn't the word say if you abide me, I abide in you? Didn't Jesus say that if you obey my commands, that me and my Father will come and dwell with you and sup with you, right? 
So look at your temple as now the house of God. Doesn't the Bible say that the kingdom of God is neither here nor there, but where? Within? Hello? So you see, now you are the house of God until Jesus comes and takes us from this planet. You are the Father's house. And in you are rooms. Does everybody get it? And we want every one of these rooms filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one. Now, go to Hebrews 3. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 3. <coughs> Glory to God. And verses 4 through 6. Hebrews 3 verses 4 through 6. Is everybody there? For every one, for every house is built by someone. But he, who is Jesus, who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of these things which be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So we are the house of Christ, aren't we? Amen. So everybody get it? It's what the Word says. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we should not look like we're the house of Christ. Sometimes we don't feel like we're the house of Christ. And sometimes we don't think we're the house of Christ. Amen. But we are the house of Christ. Hallelujah. I'll turn to 2 John, please. <laughs> Thank God we don't go by our feelings. 2 John. 2 John. Glory to God. Oh, open our eyes, Master. Enlighten your word to us. Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, understand that an antichrist is a representation of a demonic spirit. Every demon is an antichrist. Why? Because they're against Christ. Now, Christ represents the anointing of God. Does everybody get that? So, do you believe that a believer can have an antichrist? Amen, he can. He or she can. Especially those who come against the Spirit of God or the move of God. They have a spirit of antichrist because Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. Does everybody get it? Okay, let's go on. In verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Why? Because the spirit of Antichrist is going to try and come and sway you. You know, when we break covenant with God, we lose everything that we've worked for. Because the Bible tells us that when a righteous man turns from his righteousness, all of his righteousness is blotted out. It's, un it's forgotten, not remembered. But thank God that he gives us an opportunity to start over again. Amen. Amen. And verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Wow. That means anyone who transgresses, anyone who has been going to church, anyone who has been walking with the Lord for a period of time, anyone that chooses not to abide in, in the doctrine of God, in the doctrine of Christ, and walks away from Christ is not his anymore. Does everybody understand that? Because the Bible says that we can walk away from the Lord, can't we? At any time. But that doesn't mean that that person can't be reconciled, does it? But it means because God is the God of now. Does everybody understand that? What you are doing right now is what's important, isn't it? See, everything that you did yesterday and everything that you're wanting to do tomorrow has no effect or bearing on what you're doing right now. Everybody get it? Right now. He is the God of now. So what we are doing right now is, if you died right now, it depends on where you are with God. If you're broken covenant with God right now, you won't go home. If you're right with God right now, you will. Because it depends on who you're serving when you die. Is where you go. Okay. So he, said, he warns us, he said, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. So we see many people have come and said, yes, I'm a believer, right? But they don't believe the word. Well, then they're not a believer, are they? Okay. <clears throat> he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the what? The 
Hallelujah. And who brings the Father and the Son? The Holy Spirit. In verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your what? Hallelujah. What's he talking about? You. Don't receive him into you, man. Don't listen to it. Don't let it even get in you. If that person is not carrying the doctrine of Christ, hello? It says, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. Amen? For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. <laughs> Praise God. Go to, let's see here, Timothy. I think it's 2 Timothy. No, it's 1 Timothy chapter 4. So you must understand that we must protect this house. We must protect this house. Amen? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1. Is everybody there? Let's read this together. 1 Tim Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says... Now if, he's, if the Spirit is expressly saying... Remember I shared with you before that he's... Uh, lighting this whole thing up in neon lights. He's tugging you. He's saying, yo, hey, what's up? Come on, listen to me. Open your eyes. It's like Jesus when he says, assuredly I say to you. Well, we see here that the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. So he is warning us, isn't he? He says, some are going to depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits. And what's a deceiving spirit? It's a demon. It's an antichrist. Hello? And it says, taking heed. In other words, listening to them. Taking heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, known as the doctrine of what? Antichrist. Do you understand what that parallels with Second John and what we just read? Don't let nobody come to you. If they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, they are obviously in the abiding in the doctrine of the Antichrist. And what's in that individual is a deceiving, seducing spirit trying to sway you from the truth of the doctrine of Christ and bring to you a false doctrine known as doctrines of demons. Now remember, doctrines of men come from doctrines of demons. They are the same. Rules and regulations that man gives is from a demon. It's from an Antichrist. Because what it's trying to do is try and bring you under the law of rules and regulations instead of fellowship with Christ. Amen? Okay. Praise be to God. Now, go to Deuteronomy 8.14. De De Deuteronomy. That's the Deuteronomy shuffle. In the Holy Ghost, though, okay? So we must have the discernment of what we're listening to. Who we're listening to. Let me tell you, many people are going to knock on your front door and have a Bible in their hand. In fact, Paul warned us, he said, many will come and preach the same gospel, but it will be a different Jesus. Hmm. He warned us. He said, many will come and preach the same gospel, but they'll interpret it in a different way but they won't be preaching the same Jesus. Because the Jesus we know is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And he is the way, truth, and life. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 14. Everybody there? And it says, When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now, Egypt is a representation of worldly, worldly. Egypt is a representation of worldly. And we know who's the ruler of the world? Satan. So under, when you're worldly and you're under the authority of the world, you're under the authority of Satan. And you're in bondage, aren't you? Hello. We were in bondage. In fact, our house was known as the house of bondage. <laughs> Praise be to God. But thank God for Jesus. Would you turn to 2 Timothy 2, please? 2 Timothy 2. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. No longer the house of bondage, but the house of freedom. 
the house of the Lord. Glory. Second Timothy chapter 2. Hallelujah. It's under the T's. A lot of T's in there. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Whoa. So if you're saying you're a believer, you better depart from iniquity. Because if you're saying you're a believer and you're not parting from iniquity, you're not His. In verse 20, but in a what? Great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Well, we want to be a vessel of honor, don't we? Verse 21. Therefore, if anyone, anyone, if anyone, that means me or you, cleanses himself, that means it's our responsibility, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master and prepared for every good work. Now he tells us what to do. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what? Pure heart. But avoid foolish and arrogant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Strife is demonic. Strife is demonic. And 24. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. What's the next thing? Able to teach. Patient. In humility. Correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Whoa. 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 So you know what? We must be able to teach. Hello? We must be able to teach. Now, we need to be cleansing ourselves so we can be a vessel of honor, right? Ready for the Master's use. Now, Ephesians 6.12. The famous Ephesians 6.12. Like I said, you're going to hear this over and over on this ministry. <laughs> That's the one thing people seem to forget, especially believers. <laughs> In Ephesians 6.12, let's read that famous verse together. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Whoa. In other words, you and I are fighting demonic forces. Hello? We are fighting demons. We're not fighting one another. Glory to God. Now, we were just talking about cleansing ourselves from all filthiness, right? We were just talking about making sure that no other doctrine came into our spirit or into our house that was not of the doctrine of Christ. We just talked about fighting demonic powers. And even Jesus fought demonic powers, didn't he? And God. Let's go to Mark 16 in verse 5. Mark 16, verse 5, and this is, remember I share with you, Jesus casts out a lot of demons himself. And in verse 5, and it says, And entering the tomb, and this was after Jesus rose from the dead, and we know that others came down to the tomb and entered the tomb. And after entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. 
Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Hmm. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Now, isn't it amazing that he had cast seven demons out of her? What's seven mean again? Complete. Complete. Isn't it amazing that she was the first one he appeared to? Hmm. You know, people say, well, they're, uh, they don't believe in women preachers. Well, the first one to preach the resurrection of Jesus was Mary Magdalene. <laughs> didn't she go in and tell the disciples and they didn't believe her, right? So anyone comes to you and tries to throw the religion garbage on you about, you know, well, you can't, uh, there ain't no woman preacher supposed to be preaching. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's just, it's not biblical. The, the biblical standpoint of this is there are women preachers. Hello? So anyways, we understand here that the number seven means complete and means perfect. But Jesus appeared to her. There's a reason for this and why he cast out seven demons. Well, the Bible says that in this house there are rooms, aren't they? Do you think that there's seven rooms in this house? <coughs> Hallelujah. Well, if she was complete and he revealed himself to her first, she had to be clean, right? So if you look at your house and our own houses, these temples, let's look at them as seven rooms in this temple, Okay. Did you ever notice that, let me share this with you. Did you ever notice somebody could be praying in the Spirit and still do wicked things? Hello? Well, maybe the Holy Ghost is only, maybe the Holy Ghost is only in one of the house, in one of the rooms, and he's desiring to be in all the rooms. Did everybody get it? Did you ever notice that somebody's doing good at one part, they'd be praying in the Spirit, going to church, but man, they got an anger problem. Hello? And everything just tips them off instantly. That means that one of those rooms is not filled with the Holy Ghost. That room has got another person in there. Hello? Let me tell you something. It is so foolish that people think that because you have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that you cannot have a demon. That is ridiculous. What do you think why people go out and backslide and go use or go fornicate? That demon makes gets access to us, doesn't he? Wham! The next thing we know, we start seeing those shadows and hearing those voices and doing those things that we shouldn't have been doing. Now we're serving the devil again, right? Does it mean God's left us? No. No. He's still trying to draw us to him, isn't he? He's still trying to bring us to a place. In fact, he's trying to get us in position for repentance and reconciliation. Now I'll show you something. Let's go to Matthew 12. Let's go to Matthew 12. You know, in the book of Ephesians, it says, Be not drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's our responsibility to stay filled on the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's our responsibility to stay cleansed. It's our responsibility not to go back to those youthful lusts. It's our responsibility. Jesus has given me, you and everybody here, all the tools, right? He's given us everything. Remember, I shared already before that Jesus is the way, truth, and life. That means he's the door to all freedom. Hallelujah. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 12, and in verse 25. No, in verse 43. Sorry. Matthew 12, and verse 43. Hope you got your erasers. Is everybody there? Let's read this together. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my... Wait a minute. Whose house? My house. Wow. So do you remember when I shared with you before that those demons still look at you as their house? And they're going to return, return, return. They want their house back. Hello. Why? Because they were sitting in Easy City. <laughs> they would just be sitting in there and when they wanted to get fed, they'd get fed. When they wanted to rest, they would rest, wouldn't they? Amen. Hello. Then, then he says, I will return to my house, come on, from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Now listen. In other words, he's been cleaned. It's been put in order. But it's not filled. Hello? It's not filled. It's been cleaned, 
put in order, but it hasn't maintained filling of the Holy Spirit. Now what does it say? Verse 45. Then he goes, takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. How many spirits? Seven. seven. Hmm. You think that there might be seven rooms in this house? Amen. Amen. Does everybody get it? So it's important for me and you to maintain the infilling of the Spirit of God in all these rooms. Now God begins to deal with us as individuals in certain areas of our life. The Bible says you can tell, their, tell them by their fruits, right? Well, you can tell by your fruits of what, what you're dealing with. You're still lost in and still whatever. You're still angry. you still got desires, certain things that are happening. That means that not that room has not been filled, cleaned up yet. Hello? And listen, remember the, the Lord said that many will fall from taking heed or listening to deceiving spirits. That's how they enter too, just by agreeing with them. Remember, a corruptible seed gets planted, right? And then it gets watered. That's all the devil, by listening to it, he plants a corruptible seed in one of those rooms. And then it grows. And unless you curse that corruptible seed or you get rid of it, that thing will grow. It will allow a spirit back in there and you have trouble. How many people, now check this out. The Lord says it's an abomination to build on the things he's delivered you from. It's an abomination to Christ. To build on the things he's doing. Let's just say for an example, because this is the biggest example I can give. Cigarettes. People get freed from cigarettes. Now they, they know the Lord. And they go back out, you know, and, and they're working again. And all of a sudden they pick up a cigarette. You know what happens? They begin to rely on that cigarette, hello, as a fulfillment. That means they're building on the things that God has delivered them from. That's an abomination to the Lord. That means that when they lit that cigarette, put it to their lips, they breathed in, what does breath mean? Spirit. They breathed in that first cigarette. He just entered in one of those rooms. And let me tell you something. Everyone that I know that has been bound by drugs and alcohol in any way, when they pick up that first cigarette, it's a matter of a couple weeks or a matter of a short period of time where they're back using again. Everyone. Hello? Anyone that's come to Christ. Now, we know that there's many people involved in 12-step programs that are huffing away and drinking coffee. But they still have demons in them. They're not freed yet. Those spirits are just being starved. Hello? They're not delivered yet because they still, they cause them to do something else. They're still fornicating. They're still doing this and whatever. So they're going to hell not using. Hello? You know, how long have you been clean? And they think they've been clean. Just because, you know, when you ever run into them, they go, well, how many medallions have you had? Or how long have you been clean? It's not about how long you've been clean, brothers, anymore. It's not about days. <laughs> it's about relationship. It's about knowing the King of glory. So we see here that Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene, and he revealed himself to her first. Hallelujah. And we read here now that seven spirits return. We know that the word seven, the number seven, is a representation of complete, perfect, or finished. Hello. We know that spirits can enter by things of enticement, by taking heed. They plant that corruptible seed. When we say yes, they're in. Hello? Okay. Let's go a little further. Let's go to verse 25, since we're in Matthew 12. In verse 25, and it says, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to des desolation. And every city, or what? House divided against itself will not stand. Do you understand that? Amen. If, if you've got demons in that house, it's not going to stand, is it? It's just a matter of time for it to fall. You know, I was involved in another ministry at one time, and I was pastoring there. And uh, the director and myself, uh, because of their programming and so forth, I, was, I didn't like it. And because as far as I was concerned, it was 12-step in it. And, and it was supposed to be, a, a, they said Christ-centered. Well, this ministry is not Christ-centered. It's Christ-head. Hello? So anyways, um, there was a discrepancy. 
another, and I didn't want to hear the word programming. I didn't want to hear the word 12-step. And I, you know, I was like, man, anyway. So when guys would come into this place, I would have them read deliverance prayers, anoint their head, take them in the back room and cast out devils. The problem was is they, when they would come out of the room, they would pick them back up after a period of time because they weren't being filled with the Word of God. They were being memorized with 12 steps. So after a year there, you know, I realized that there was this discrepancy and what kept coming to me was this house is going to fall. This ministry is going to fall. And I said, Lord, either remove me because at least it's the ministry helping and there's not enough of them out there and hopefully you'll rescue the people out of it, you know, or change this director's heart and let this be a full-fledged Christ ministry and get the 12 steps out of here and stop the smoking on the campus and clean it up. Well, the next day, <laughs> or that week it was, the next day I got a, a letter saying he wanted to meet me. And that week he asked me to leave. And I thanked the Lord. Of course, you know, they probably think that, you know, because of this guy's a quack, because they used to come to me and say, man, you think there's a demon around every corner? I wanted to tell them sometimes, there is, and there's one talking to me right now. But I never did say that. <laughs> well, you know that when there's demonic oppression there, there's deception, isn't there? A light would be seen. I mean, you know, you'd be able to tell. You would, most people who are, have demons don't know it. I mean, come on. They don't know it. <laughs> I mean, but after a period of time, after you've tasted the goodness of the Lord and you've got a demon, you know it. Somebody's usually telling you, then you know it. <laughs> Man, you got a demon, brother. What? what? Come on. No way. Demons can't possess. Listen, it doesn't mean that you have to be foaming at the mouth and acting goofy. They have a demon. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is what people are looking at. What do you mean? I can't be possessed. It doesn't mean that you're totally possessed. It means that there's a demon in one of those rooms. Hello. It means there's a demon in one of those rooms that needs to get cleaned out. To God be the glory. Let's go a little further. Where are we at now? Hallelujah. Okay, let's go on. Divide. Okay, verse 26. Everybody there? Amen. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? <laughs> Therefore, they shall be your judges. But I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Hello. Or, listen to this now. Or how, come on, let's read this together. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his goods or his house. Now, that's talking about demons in a house, isn't it? Jesus is explaining this. He's not talking about no physical. He's talking about a spiritual. And he calls the demon a strong man. Now, I want to explain to you a strong man. A strong man is a high-ranking demon. In the demonic world, we have principalities, powers of darkness, and so forth. It's a war. It's a military there are principalities that are over countries, over nations, and over cities. They're all ranking. Now, those are not demons. Those are angels that are servants of the Lord, uh, servants of Satan. They are known as principalities. Principalities are not demons. Okay? Demons are here on the earth because they are disembodied spirits that desire a body. When Satan fell, when Satan was removed from the throne room of God, he took a third of the angels with him. Those angels are not demons. They're still angels. Hello? Amen. Angels do not possess bodies. Or man, I should say. Angels put on flesh. Okay, that's a whole other teaching. But anyways, demons possess bodies because they are disembodied spirits that want a body. Now, there are ranking officers in demonic military. And they fight one another. In fact, they use you to fight one another. Hello? Come on, let's, let's get deep in this. All right? They want to be high-ranking. They are disorderly. And they're out for selfish gain. But there is a strong man known as a high-ranking demon. And this strong man 
his demons under the authority of him. Is everybody with me? So when you enter a house, in other words, when you pray for someone, you bind the strong men in that house. Sometimes the Lord will tell you to be specific in what they are. Sometimes he'll just tell you to do it. But you'll know the strong men by its fruit. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now, you can tell the fruits of a tree by what the fruit is, right? You can tell what kind of tree it is, whether it's an orange tree or whatever. You know, it's, I mean, if, there, if there's orange fruit, it's an orange tree, right? Okay. Well, if there's a person of a, if there's addiction there, right, we know that it's a strong man. And that strong man, it can lead to many things. It could be addiction of perversion. It could be an addiction of drugs or alcohol. It could be, so it could be many things. But you know, understand this. Your main concern is to bind the strong man or you cannot enter the house. Because the strong man is the one that's given the orders to the demons that are under him. If you bind the strong man, he can't give the orders to the other demons. Hello? And then you can command them to go. And the strong man will have to go with it. Is everybody with me? So we see here that we must first bind the strong man. Now let me share this with you. In your job place, if you do not, in the morning, attack the devil before he attacks you, he'll get you later. Is everybody with me? That's why it's important for you to bind the strong men that will come against you in your prayers every single day. Not only at a time when you're going to have to pray. And you can bind strong men even when you're praying for people. And it doesn't matter. There's no distance in the spirit, right? Now, binding the strong man doesn't mean that the strong man is bound forever. It's a temporary bind so that you can access and do your work and then leave. Does everybody understand that? Because if we were to just go around and say, okay, well, Lord, we bind every spirit, you know, evil, it doesn't work. Hello? Okay. So, when you, even before you go to a job place, before I go minister, I bind every strong man that would try and come against me or that house. Why? So I can enter and plunder the goods of the evil one. So I can enter, and as the Holy Spirit ministers through this vessel, he can plant the righteous seed. Does everybody understand that? Amen. So that in hope that seed won't be stolen, and that strong man will be bound. Does everybody understand that? And you must bind strong men every day. It, just because you bind it one day doesn't mean it's bound the next. Does everybody get that? So there could be a strong man in one of those rooms. And those fruits, let me just share with you this. Lust. There's a, there's a strong man of jealousy. Hello? Under him could be lust or perversion. Murder. I mean, rage. All of those things lead to one another, don't they? Anger. All of those lead to one another. So unless you first bind that strong man, the rest of those will still be there. Does everybody get it? It's important that you take authority and bind that strong man. Especially before you go to work, when you enter a place. It must be a part of your life. No matter where my wife and I go, even when we go to a restaurant, we bind the strong man. No matter where we go, we bind the strong man. Before I come into a teaching, like I said, I bind the strong man. Before services, we pray, we bind the strong man. And we command him to go. Hello? Hallelujah. Okay. And Matthew 16. Glory to God. And Matthew 16, and verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this, but my Father in heaven. <clears throat> and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, and he means on this rock, the rock was at the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. Peter's not the rock. Does everybody understand that? The rock was the revelation that he had, that Jesus was the anointed one and his anointing. He was the power of God who was known as the Christ. Jesus is the name of the Christ. So he said, Simon Barjona, blessed are you, right? 
In verse 18 it says, And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, or on this revelation, I will build my church. Now who builds the church? The Holy Spirit. Does everybody understand that? Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit builds it. Now what does he tell him? Now that you got this revelation that I am the anointed one with the anointing, and I'm going to build my church by the anointing, I'm going to give you something. And he says, and I will give you... Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Let's go back. And I will build my church in what? The gates of Hades shall not what? Prevail against it. And verse 19, and I will give you the what? Keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Does everybody get this? Now, he says, whatever you bind or loose on earth, in other words, whatever you do in the natural side, what you speak, do you understand that, will happen in the spiritual side. So important that we take our authority because on the revelation, you know what, people don't bind and loose. They don't use those keys. You know why? Because they don't have that revelation of the anointed one and his anointing. Does everybody get that? Because they don't get the revelation of the anointed one and his anointing. Because through the Spirit of God, you'll get that revelation. Because he says, I'm building... These are keys he's given me and you. A key locks and a key unlocks, doesn't it? These are keys. Now, we talked about other keys before, about the keys of symbols and so forth, of revealing not wisdom and knowledge and, and mysteries of God. But this key is a key of warfare. Why? So that we can expand the kingdom of God. Does everybody understand that? By rescuing people, the kingdom of God is being expanded, isn't it? By people getting freed and set, and set free from demonic activity and so forth. Set free from bondages of debt. Some people have had the spirit of debt brought down on their, from ancestral curses that they can't get rid of. And they're brought up and they learn that they can live with debt. Hello? There are so many poor people out there because they, they've learned that they can live with debt. Or, or live in poverty. But God has not brought poverty, did he? He said that I brought life for you and that you could have life more abundantly. So not only is prosperity for me and you, but health and wisdom and understanding and bringing the truth of these things, of the mysteries of God and promises of God to those who are bound, poor, outcast, lost, blinded. Hello? Hello? So you and I must use these keys of binding and loosening. It is important that you use them. These are keys that Jesus paid the price for, me and you. That when he sent the Holy Spirit, these are one of the keys that he has given me and you. So whatever you bind in the earth, on earth, which means in the natural, whatever you speak is what's bound in the spiritual. Hello? Okay. Praise be to God. And you'll know these what? Spirits by their fruit. So you want to bind the strong man. So you bind the spirit in an individual. Hello? You bind the spirit and you loose the person. And I'll show you. And John 11. Oh, hallelujah. More. Oh, let me tell you something. There can be more than one strong man in you at one time. Yes. If your rooms are not filled with the spirit of God, there could be two strong men in a room or in one room. There could be two strong men in two rooms. Forgive me. Hallelujah. But the Bible tells us that Seven spirits or seven rooms. So you can look at a strong man in each room. And there could be more than one demon in that room, though. Does everybody understand that? But there would be a strong man there. Hello? To God be the glory. Okay, let's go to John 11. John 11. That's why there are some people that, you know, they want to, uh, they can worship the Lord. They can go to Bible study. And any outwardness, they look like they're doing okay. But inwardly, they're tormented. Big time. Tormented. In fact, they're doing things behind closed doors that are not right because a strong man or a demon is there. That that room has not been cleaned yet. That's why you see people go to church, right? And the next thing you know, their wife is calling. My husband just came home from church and beat me up. Oh man, something ain't right. Something ain't right. Well, they just he just left church and went and used. Well, that spirit's not gone then, is he? Hello? And he's not filled, is he? That's why it's so important. If you pour water in a glass and it's not full, that means something else can get in. In fact, you know what's there? Air. 
Hello. So you need to keep it filled, right? You need to keep it filled with the right air, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and John 11 and verse 38. John 11, verse 38. Everybody there? Amen. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself. Now, I want to back up a little bit just to show you what's going on. Lazarus, a friend of his, died. And his sisters, Martha and Mary, came running to Jesus and said, please help him. Jesus took four days to get there. And uh, he's already in the tomb. Now, in verse 38, Now Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. There was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the cave. Who took away the, who, take away the stone? Who took away the stone? They did. Hello. Come on. Everybody with me? you got to move away that stone. Stony heart. you got to move away that stone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then Jesus said, Take away that stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. In other words, Lord, he's been laying in there four days. It stinks. Come on, you really don't want to move that stone, do you? I mean, you know, we're all going to smell this out here. And you really, but she's lost sight about her brother is dead and Jesus is about to raise him. Because prior to this, he said to her, I am the resurrection. Hello. In verse 40, and Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now let me share with you. There are many people who are bound. They are bound with grave clothes. Did you notice where they were bound? Kind of Christ. They're bound. What are they bound by? Grave clothes. And who's the author of death? Satan. <clears throat> but who did he say to, let, to loose them? Jesus didn't go loose them, did he? He said, you loose them. Hello? Jesus said, you loose them. So you loose the individual. Do you understand that? You bind the spirit and you loose the individual. Those are keys that God has given me and you. Now you can loose yourself too. And you can bind the strong man. Every day on those daily confessions, Lord, I loose myself from all demonic activity. Lord, I, when I get up every morning, the first thing I'm doing is I'm binding powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places, every spirit under the authority of Satan, every strong man. I'm binding every spirit that will come against my prayers. And then I begin to loose myself from self-imposed curses and so forth. And that's another teaching. But we'll get to that. I loose myself from every stronghold. I loose myself. Hello? From every tormenting spirit. I loose myself. So you have the authority to loose yourself. And you have also the authority to loose other people. Hello? So we see here that Jesus rose him from the dead and he said, you loose him from these grave clothes. Now go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Glory to God. Is everybody all right? You getting it? Amen. So you're going to bind those strong men before you go to work, before you go to any place. Yes. Hallelujah. In Matthew 21. Don't forget to shake the dust off when you come home too, okay? <laughs> Praise be to God. Amen. Those surfing demons, they like to surf us. In Matthew 21, glory to God. In verse 12. Matthew 21, verse 12. Now, we are known as the temple of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? A house. Okay. Then Jesus went into where? The temple of God. And what did he do? He drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. That was worldliness. Jesus removed the worldliness from the temple. Does everybody understand that? 
And so do you and I must remove the worldliness from this temple. Amen. Hello? Amen. Now look it. And he said to them, It is written, My house should be a, called the house of what? Prayer. Prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And we don't want our house to be a den of thieves, do we? We want it to be a temple or a house of prayer. Then, in verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Remember I share with you, you can't give something you haven't got. Hello. Let me share with you. That's why it's so important that you be careful that people don't lay hands on you. Just don't let nobody lay hands on you. I do not, even in the church, call people up front to lay hands on somebody. I won't do that. Because who knows where people have been. I won't do that. God has designated elders in the church to lay hands on people. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible says that you know we can go out and lay hands on people, right? Well, let me tell you something. First of all, when you're under authority in a meeting, in a, a fellowship, you must stay under that authority. Hello? The Bible says, and let the elders of the church anoint the head of the sick and they will recover, right? Why? Because they've earned the trust of God to stay clean. Does everybody understand that? To stay clean. You don't know where that person's been, do you? Man, I'm telling you, when I was pastor of this place that I got asked to get removed from, asked to leave, these guys were smoking cigarettes and they'd all be laying hands on one another. The next thing I know, everybody's huffing away. They're passing those spirits onto one another. You know, there's three types of believers. There's the obedient, isn't there? There's the believer who's obedient and bearing good fruit. Hello? And there's the disobedient, isn't there? And then there's the granola, which is called nutty and fruity. Hello? And they've gone beyond what God has called them to do in the Spirit. Beyond their anointing. And it's a whole other teaching. It's called mixed anointing. And when you go on the anointing of what God has called you to do, you will open the door for familiar spirits. And now they have fellowship with familiar spirits thinking it's the Holy Ghost. And what they say was, God told me this. God told me this. And God didn't tell them anything. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Enough of this. Let's go on. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 through 5. Everybody there? Good. Let's read it. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Yeah, you'll be rejected by men, but your daddy's always there, willing to receive you, train you, empower you, deliver you, fill you, and work through you to rescue someone else. And verse 5, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. A what? Spiritual house house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So remember, you are a priest, you are build, being built a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. Keep your house clean. Keep your house clean. I don't care what other people have said, I'm telling you, I've ministered and counseled with many believers that have had demons in them. Many. I've cast out many demons that are in believers. It's unfortunate that many of them out there do not know that they even have demons in them and they're being tormented. Remember, we want to clean all these houses out. I mean, we need to clean out all the rooms in all of our house, our full house. Every room we want to remove everything that would hinder us in any way so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit in every room of our house. Amen? So, all these houses. And you know, in true reality, if there's a spirit there, whether it's oppression, depression, or possession, who cares? Let's get rid of it. 
because the Bible says we're not fighting flesh and blood, right? So we must take our authority. So keep the house clean. Stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Stay in unity with the Spirit. Look unto Jesus as your hope and your deliverer and the author and developer of your faith and stir yourself up and don't let go of him. And he is faithful. Lord, we thank you for your word. I ask that the seed of this teaching be imparted, protected by the blood, to grow and bear fruit for your glory. As I pray a blessing on each and every one. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah.